Hey, hello everyone. Welcome back to MOC. This is episode five. Today we are going to introduce um, an interesting topic. So up until now, we talk about how can we represent machine learning programs in both primitive function and end-to-end -end fashion. And in today's lecture, we're going to talk about how can we automate some of the transformation process. Uh, another logistical announcement. So uh, it has already been updated on Call's website. Uh, after this lecture, the next uh, next week uh, I'm going to travel a bit, so we're going to skip one week session. But we'll be back with more interesting contents, and uh, there are a lot of exciting things to see today as well. So let's get started. So to get us prepared, again we are going to um, this is a more like an interactive session. So we're going to use Colab notebook here for explaining some of those concepts. We're going to import the relevant components in here. And to begin with, one of the things we want to do is we want to recap a bit of what we learned in, I think, two lectures ago um, about how we can take a primitive tensor function and then go and transform it a bit. Remember that our general principle of machine learning compilations we want to be able to represent tensor functions in different form and transform among them. And in two lectures ago, we talked about how we can take a primitive function and use a transform API or TL schedule API to allow us to go and transform the loop a bit to get a more efficient program. And then in last lecture, we talked about how we compose those primitive tensor functions together to form an end-to-end -end neural network. Of course, one of the things we might ask, you know, how those two, two things fit together, right? So one way that we can fit them together is that we can take already a primitive function that's already existing in the end to end neural network, run some transformation to get a better variant, and use that to replace the original primitive function in end to end execution. And that's what we are going to do today. Okay? So, this is a recap. So, some of the contents we already covered in, in two lectures ago. We are just going to walk through them again. So, first of all, we can use TVM script to define a set of Tensor programs that contains loops, and in this particular case, we're just using a 128 by 128 matrix multiplication as an example. And hopefully, this is a program that you have already been familiar with. Uh, some of the key concepts include the multidimensional loops, the computation body, the block constructs, and the multiple dimensional buffers. Once we have it, uh, we will define a set of input and output for our evaluation. In here, we're using NumPy as a, as a reference point. So we have that here. It should be at this level in here. And then, and then we're going to uh, create, uh, we're, we're going to create uh, a, a reference ND arrays that we can use for running this function. And in here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, build the my module function and bring a uh, tummy evaluator that help us to evaluate the overall round tummy here. And I'm going to invoke the tummy evaluator and it gives me the average round time speed of this particular function on this collab environment. So far, so good. And uh, you know, that's the first step, right? Remember that the overall step we are doing is we are going to construct or develop. Uh, IR module that contains the function of interest. In this particular case, we're interested in a primitive tensor function. We're going to, well, in this case, we're going to directly build, get the result. In some other cases, we might be interested in transforming a little bit. So, so let's let's review some of the things we learned in the last two lectures. We can go and transform the particular uh, module a bit. In this case, I'm going to define a function called schedule MMM. And what, what we're doing is we're going to get the blocks out, get the loops, do a loop splitting and reordering and change the, the reduction here. So to see what effect it will bring us, we can run this code block. And we effectively we are creating a schedule, feed it into the schedule mm function here. And then we're going to use this uh, display utility to show what's the transform code. So um, in this transform code, we can find that there's a new loop in here called J1. And, uh, and in this case, you can find that uh, uh, this new loop here, J1, contains uh, you know, 
is reordered with the k, right? So in this iterations, we are we start with iterating on k, then j1, and this is the uh, tensor IR program after this transformation. Okay, so this is basically an overview of what we learned two lectures ago, and uh, it it gives us uh, you know then we have a reorganized program. So this is a program that hopefully, as we explained in two lectures ago. Um, you will be able to allow to reorganize the program, get a bit more cache locality, and uh, we can go ahead, go ahead and build it. Um, and we'll find that actually, compared to the runtime that we had in here, 3.487 minute a microsecond, in this particular case, this transform code did give us a bit of had a uh, bit of improvement over the original program. So that's a quick overview, a quick, quick review of what we learned before. And now let's start to uh, learn something new that uh, comes with this schedule transformation. So up until now, when we are examining this code, right, what we do is we call the schedule function, and we just display the script result in here. And this shows the tensor IR that we have after the schedule transformation. Now, besides this way to show it, another thing that actually the TIR schedule provides us is this uh, function is called trace. So I'm going to go ahead and print it out. And what you can find is actually this trace kind of exactly corresponds to the set of transformations we run in order to get this schedule. So for example, in this particular case, you'll find that the first call get block, and then get loops. Except the you know loop the variables that naming are different, but other the end effect is the same, right? It's going to go split, reorder, and decompose reduction. Okay, uh, uh, it's a bit hard to see it, but it might be easier to see it side by side. So I'm going to also insert a code block here. Uh, let's try. It's already um, run, which so that we already have a schedule variable. So I can run schedule.chase here. And we can compare, right? So we can find this line correspond to this line, uh, this line correspond to this line, split function in here, factor equals four, reorder, and decompose reduction. So this trace actually records the set of transformations that uh, that was being performed on this schedule. And we can use that to as a way to, to see you know, what are the history transformations that we need to get to this point. And uh, so why is it useful? Right now, you know, for the deterministic schedule, it's only a way for us to remember what we have done before. Uh, so, uh, but we're gonna use it throughout the, the rest of the chapter and be with us, you know, this is gonna be useful for us to start to make use of this tracing here, okay? So up until now, we have talked about uh, what transformation we wanna make on the original tensor program. In this case, the original, uh, the original program is, um, you know, two-dimensional matrix application, 128 by 128. However, we are trying to specify, in this case, all the possible details that we want the final program. So in, so in this case, when we are transforming loop, we already have what the programs that we want in mind. We want to be able to write a loop in this way. The factor should exactly be four. And then that's our final program. In many cases, however, even though I'm a you know I have worked on parallel computing and um, sometimes you know optimizing compilers for quite a bit, even I don't know how exactly that we want to optimize a particular code. Of course, there are principles like cache localities, making use of power, and so on. So so the question is, you know, what if we don't exactly know what we want, but we kind of have a rough idea of you know the overall direction, what can give us a possible possibly optimized program. So what can we do? So one question we want to ask, you know, instead of specifying everything very accurately, can we try to specify what are the possible ways we can transform it while leaving out some of the details, uh, hopefully, you know, to the, to the system to figure it out. And that's what we're going to talk about now. So this is what we call stochastic schedule transformation. And uh, it's being achieved by this particular function called stochastic schedule MM. Okay, so let's walk through the code. 
Uh, you will find that actually this code is looks very very similar to to the schedule mm that we had before. So might be useful to see it side by side. So on the left hand side, it's a stochastic version of schedule mm, and on the right hand is schedule mm. Okay. So let's compare line by line. So first of all, the first line is the same, right? The second line is the same. The difference is that on a stochastic version, now this call called sample perfect tile. So instead of directly specifying, hey, my J factor equals four, what stochastic schedule means? So stochastic, or usually it means random processing. So it says there's some randomness in here. So where does randomness come from? Randomness come from this sampling. In this case, the sample perfect tile tries to draw uh, these J factors from a distribution. We'll talk about what that distribution is, but effectively try to you know collect something, right? That that uh, sometimes you know if you run once, it will might gives you one kind of factor of how do we want split loop. Another time we run, it might give you another another one. So effectively, it's a sample call. After we get a J factor, it's the same split call. Right? On the left hand side, you get split in here that pass the J vectors. Same split core, same reorder, and same decompose reduction. Okay, so you can find that the only difference from what we call a schedule mm to stochastic mm is actually this additional sampling step. And in here, sample perfect tile. So this particular function actually just draws random number that that's going to gives you two random numbers usually. And the perfect tile means that we want to sample. Uh, integers that uh, perfectly factorize the original loop. So because our original loop size is 128, so there are different possible ways where we can get two to eight, eight by 16, 32 by four, two by 64, and all of this, you know, if you multiply all those pairs together, 64 in here, and uh, it should be 128, okay? Uh, And you know um, now we have talked about what are the uh, now we have talked about you know what are the possible ways we can use to to run a stochastic schedule. Let's try to run in action and see you know what uh, what what the code it can generate. Uh, so if you go and run it, you'll find that it's going to get give you one version of a code. In this particular version, if you look at the uh, J1 grid. This value equals one. So actually, in this case, the J factor, uh, in this particular case, the J factor equals 128 and one. Okay. And if I'm going to run again, and again, well, you can find that this internal factor changes, right? It becomes two by 64. So in this particular case, it's 64 by two. So you can find effective what's happening is that every time I'm going to run the stochastic schedule, it's going to give me a random program, or a, a program from a space of programs. And each of the time, the selection can be different. So for in this case, it's eight by 16 as my uh, stochastic factor, right? So the idea is that, you know, because we are introducing some randomness, what we are going to get is no longer a, a program. We are going to get different programs every time we call this function, and and you know effectively, uh, this gives us a distribution of programs, a collection of programs that uh, that that specify a possible space of program that we're interested in. And now, this is where trace can come in handy, right? Because every time uh, now we uh, we have the transformer program. We can also print out a trace. You can find that the trace now contains a sample perfect tile, and there's a decision field which was not specified in the original course, but it's being recorded in a trace. And this means that actually in this particular case, the sample value of factors equals eight by sixteen in here. And if you double check, you will find that hey, this is you know sixteen, and uh, the the outer loop J one is eight. Right. So, so effectively, this records the particular decision of this this sample parse that gives you. And this is a very interesting way for us to take a look at the the transforming decisions, right? So, 
effectively this particular if you have an initial program and you have a linearized trace, the particular trace also represents what's the final program that we might get. Okay. And so so because trace is another alternative way, so we can you know go and try and run this and print our trace, and you can find that every time you look at the decision field, the decision field in here kind of changes every time we changes the every time or well, sometimes because you know, we, are, we are drawing sample with without replacement right so every time uh, we will sometimes we'll see the same thing but sometimes we will see different values as decisions in here okay so that's the first taste of stochastic transformation let's start to dive a bit deeper on what's exactly you know what are additional details we're going on so if you review these stochastic transformations You'll find that it's a simple generalization of our original gadget element with two additional elements. First of all, we have sample per tau. It's going to return uh, two variables in here, which we'll call random variables. That that uh, and and you know sometimes you can use sample per tau to get random numbers that perfectly factorize a loop. We also have other sampling operations like we can sample from a selection of deterministic values like you know four, two, or eight. And so on. Uh, we did not cover in this example, but uh, there are other sampling operations that, that are available. The second thing is that you know we will have scheduled transformation before those scheduled transformations can take in you know concrete integer numbers like factor equals four to specify the size of a loop they want to they want to factorize. In this particular case, these actions can depend on those random variables in here. So depending on what result what decisions were made at random variable sampling the subsequent operations uh, and the result of subsequent operations can change okay so let's try to run those stochastic transformations step by step right so the first thing we can do is we can go and uh, run sample perfect tile if you look at this uh, result of sample perfect tile actually they are not real integer numbers they are what we call symbolic variables so these variables just records that hey here's a random variable that we are interested in and when we pass those variables through transformation api they will they will allow us to specify the choice of of the factor values and those choices again are being recorded in a trace in here so so effectively the schedule itself knows like you no know, in this particular evaluation of a trace um, this j factor 0 correspond to 128 and j factor 1 will correspond to 1 in this particular case and if you go and look at the the code that we have so far you can find that the code does not change right because effectively at this point we have only sampled the random variables but we have not yet taken any actions that depends on those random variables so if you look at the trace we do have those sample perfect tile action but it does not impact the current code that are being uh, produced. Okay, so after we sample the random variables, we can go and take some actions. Right, so we'll be able to run the split that depends on a J factor and reorder. And after we run it, if you look at the trace again, you'll find that we kind of append those operations onto the trace. And if you look at this code that being transformed in here. You can find that in this particular case, you know, it is indeed different, right? So the order of K and J1 are different. There's additional uh, loop of length one because in this particular case, we are drawing a sample of, you know, 128 by one as part of this decision. So this kind of loop reflects the programs that uh, this trace gives us. And finally, we can call re reorder decompose reduction and that gives us the final uh, transform loop in here. Okay, so one of the interesting things that you observe is that it is a simple ingredient, which is sampling, that we add to this particular set of transformations, and it gives us a very powerful way to go from a single program. You know, you take a single program, you transform it, you get a single program that's original. Uh, original way of you know expressing possible program transformations 
In that particular case, in the original, we kind of have to specify all the details during the transformations. And it requires a lot of expertise and also hand tuning if we really want to go and optimize programming network. And if we just, just add a tiny bit of you know, randomness in here, and it will give us a space of possible programs as opposed to a single program. And this kind of programming model is usually called a probabilistic list programming because you know, when, we are, when we are working on these uh, transformations and actions, some of them involve random sampling. And it's a very powerful way for us to express a space of possible choices in here. As a result, you know, when we are very certain, for example, in certain cases, we are very certain that we want to reorganize the program this way, we don't have to draw random samples. We can just directly specify that, hey, I'm going to do a thing, things this way. But in certain cases, when we are not very certain about, you know, hey, what is the length of the loop I want to split to, what are the other possible choices, we can try to leave that to the system. So it gives us a way to specify things that we are really certain about while leaving out the choices that are not very, very certain to the system. Okay. Now, what we're getting is the space of possible programs, right? So one more question we have is still, you know, yes, the space is good. What we want is, you know, we want to be able to take the space and still narrow it down to find a good choices, right? a good set of random decisions that leads to an optimized program. So one thing we can do is we can try to do search on that space. And let's try to do that. And the first attempt that we can do is we can actually go ahead and write a Python code. That, that works in this way. So the idea is that because every time when we call a stochastic uh, schedule MM, it gives, gives me a you know random program, a program randomly selected from that space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to every time pick a random program, go ahead and build and benchmark it to see how fast it is, and then repeat it again so that you know for a few times so that we pick and then we pick the best one across all the rocks. Right? So effectively, he has a simple program that tries to do that. So you take an IR module, every time you call a stochastic sampling function, you build a program, and then you try to evaluate the result, which is the time cost in here. And then we're going to print out trace so you can see every time what is the, exactly the proposal is. And then you try to bookkeep and try to, you know, uh, both keep the best results so far, and finally you want to re return the best result in here. Okay, so this is a quick, dirty way of doing, you know, random search. Random search is good in all cases. At least, you know, if you run long enough, it gives you a uh, quite decent result if the search space is, is good, okay? So if you run it, you can find that, you know, it tries five attempts. I'm not going to try a lot, but five attempts. Each of attempt gives you different decisions, like 64 by 2, 16, by eight, 16 by eight, 64 by two, 64. Oh, in this case, they only <laughs> randomly select two choices. That's fine. Uh, if you're going to run, run again, it's going to uh, try different choices. Random search is very dumb. And in this case, it's a very, very dumb version that just draws samples from that. And you'll find, if you read all the run times, you'll find that, you know, some of them, most of them are actually quite similar in this case. Maybe this one is the farthest, right? So, uh, in this particular case, 64 by 2 is not that good. I'm just try going to try one time again to see if it gives a better answer. Yeah, so in this particular case, you can find this one gives, you know, quite good answer in this case. And if you if you go ahead and play another chase, you'll find that it picks, you know, 8 by 16 in this case. And, uh, and usually, you know, this program, and, and then, you know, we can use this. Uh, as our final program of interest within that space, okay? So, so that's our, you know, poor man's version of doing stochastic search or random search over the space. But the general idea is you can, you can give you an idea of how we can take a stochastic transformations and compose that with a search, right? So, so you'll be able to go and pick things from a space and do search. Uh, in practice, we want to do a lot more things. For example, in certain cases, what if we want to try and do stochastic search on, if what if we want to deploy onto say my browser or my mobile devices, then we can no longer do benchmarking on Jupyter notebook. So we kind of need a way for us to do benchmarking. Sometimes, you know, we also don't want to do this dumb stochastic search, right? Sometimes you draw the same samples and the other times, you know, you don't always need to go and run the code. In a lot of cases, we can try to build 
uh, some you know intelligent estimations of of how fast it is without having to go and run the code. So so there are better ways to do it. That's a high high level gist. And TVM provides a utility to do that search for a given search space. We don't have to go and understand all the details that I've already talked about some of the magics behind, but the key idea remains the same. So the key idea is we can use stochastic transformations to specify a search space of possible book, possibly good programs. And then we are going to call an API called tune tier that's going to help us to search and find an optimal optimized solution within that search space. Okay. So here's what the meta schedule API looks like. It's going to take a module, a task that's uh, in this particular case, the task's main function, um, the target that specifies where we want to run it. And in this particular case, we're also going to specify the number of CPU cores because this is uh, uh, this is all on the collab, so likely they don't have a lot of cores. I'm going to use one core. Uh, the tuning config specifies how many trials we want to run. I'm not going to run a lot, so these are some of the possible configurations. And then the search space come from the, the generator that generated by this stochastic function. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. It will take a while. That so effectively under the hood, it tries to go through um, possible program within that search space and uh, trying to do benchmarkings. And actually in this particular case, the meta schedule function does not use random search. So it uses a uh, advanced version called evolutionary search. And what it works is that remember that we have traces in here. So we have traces that have decisions and the, the evolutionary search would not try to rerun the sample schedule MM, but it will simply try to change the decisions that we have on, the, on the, each of the stochastic uh, sampling and then try to generate a program based on these updated decisions. And then the evolutionary search will try to you know, evolve it so that you know the the decisions that these two better programs in the middle are being favored, and we try to reject uh, these traces that does not contain better programs. And eventually, it gives us uh, uh, find a reasonable program faster. Okay, so that's kind of a high level rundown of what a, so what an evolutionary search might look like. But uh, today we are not going to into details. There are different ways, but high level ideas. Give you a third space, you will be able to use the meta schedule or tune to give you a transform schedule. So after we do that, you can find you can look at you know, what it will find. Actually, in this particular case, it also finds eight by sixteen factor. This is a set of um, program transformations that the tuner suggests. We can go ahead and. And you know, display the code that uh, do the split reorder. And uh, if we do things after tuning, you can find that 1.392 uh, comparing to the original program, it's indeed faster. But uh, in, the, in this particular case, I guess it's quite close to the original manual schedule. So, so far, we have shown that you know, for a given search space that is specified by a stochastic transformation. We'll be able to call meta schedule dot tune or to be able to get uh, get uh, an find uh, optimized program within that search space. Now, actually, meta schedule also come with a way to automatically generate a set of search space. So you, we actually don't have to specify that space. Okay. The only reason that we specified in the beginning is we want to show everybody what's the underlying mechanism. So on the underlying mechanism of this tomb is always you know trying to use stochastic transformations to craft a possible space of transformations that's going to tune it. So in this particular case, the default set of rules that uh, mass schedule build is called auto scheduling rules. And what they are trying to do is exactly a slightly more complicated version of stochastic transformations. So what, what they are doing is that those transformations will go ahead and look at the program blocks and try to reason about you know what are the possible transformation we might be able to do and then apply those so although they are slightly more complicated actually they are you know, under the hood the general principle is the same we are trying to uh, build a set of stochastic transformations and trying to use those stochastic transformation to guide our guide the construction of us of our search space okay 
So in order to use that, actually, we just need to remove the original space specifier so that it will, it's going to use a default automatic schedule. And if we'll go ahead and run it, uh, it's going to, uh, you know, use the set of internal generic schedules. And one of the interesting things is that those internal set of generic schedules don't, so originally when we were trying to write the schedule function, stochastic schedule for mission location, a lot of that is tied onto matrix fabrication itself. Like, you know, we want to get the particular block, want to be able to do those factors and so on. The set of generic schedules is made so that they are relatively generic, so you can apply them on to you know matrix multiplication, convolutions, and other settings. So you know, um, and this is kind of like a, um, another advantage in, in terms of like we don't have to exactly specify the set of transmission for a particular uh, prime function. On the other hand, there will be cases where we want to come back and extend this uh, automatic scheduling or want to be able to effectively, you know, specify program domain input onto what a search, might, search space might look like. That is the point where the stochastic transformation API is going to, again, come in handy because we are going to use the same transformation language to specify the set of possible rules that help us to generate an optimized program. Okay, so now that we transform it, we can take a look at the time. Actually, if you compare it, this one is much faster than you know, the original one. This is because the under the hood or mass schedule actually have a much larger search space than what we had before. So originally what we had is we just do one level loop splitting and reordering, and we're just tuning that particular one level of the loop size. And if you look at the trace again, you don't have to go and read all this because it contains some of these transformations that we have not yet um, learned about. But the high level summary is that it involves some of the elements, like you know, more level of loop tilings. Uh, if you look like here, at least you know, some of the tiling factors, at least four level in here, or sometimes more than four level. Uh, and sometimes it also involves a factorization of intermediate results. So in this case, this vectorize um, is uh, give us, you know, help us to leverage the underlying low level, um, low level um, CPU vector instructions, and also involves parallelization. So it, um, although I say, you know, maybe we we'll only want to have one call, but perhaps on this machine, there are parallel calls, and uh, that gives us um, better speed up. And here's the final code that being transformed. That that's slightly more complicated, right? Than than, than the original one. And uh, and this particular tensor code, at least from the benchmarking, suggests you know it runs much faster. Okay. So let's do a checkpoint. So so far, what we learned, and this most important takeaway message about you know this lecture is about automation. I right? want to be able to automate not only for us to be able to go ahead and build the program, we want to try to be able to automate the search of, of, of this program. And uh, there are a few elements, right? So first of all, it, we introduced stochastic transformations allows us to express what are the possible set of optimization we can do instead of saying, you know, hey, here's exactly what we want to do to the program. The second thing is there's a tune, tune function that, you know, for a given space, the tune function will help us to find a good solution um, within that space. And finally, uh, Meta Schedule Comma set up the default set of building transformation that covers a broad range of search space. So if you call Meta Schedule Tune, um, it will search over that default set of transformations and try to give you a reasonably good uh, uh, search space. And hopefully, you know, within that search space, find a reasonably good performing model uh, for the target device of interest. Okay, and uh, you know, if, if you are curious, if you take a look at the final program again, it does contain a few more elements. I'm going to quickly walk through them. So there are annotations like, you know, pragma maximum row steps, it will hint on the line compiler to try to unload a loop in certain cases. And there will be vectorized, make use of vector instructions. And uh, here the block annotation itself is just, you know, trying to, Inform that you know what are the what we call loop tiling structure. It's not it's not does not contain uh, does not affect any of the underlying code generation. So it's just a hint. 
So if you look at this particular program, and they are also parallelization. So, so this particular program, uh, on one hand, it uh, does contain a few more elements. On the other hand, it's not that complicated. But you know, within that third space, it's very interesting to see that this particular program, I think, runs at least 10 times faster than at least a very original program. That shows that you know, the importance of trying to explore the set of possible transformations really get a good performing code from this. Okay, so, so far we've learned automation tricks. And one thing that you might say is that, hey, this automation tricks only works for a single primitive function. How can I use that for my end-to-end -end neural network execution? So let's try to do that. And uh, the hard of idea is that, you know, now we have a tool that allows you to take a primitive function, construct a search space, and within that search space, find a good solution. One thing we can do is, you know, for end-to-end -end neural net executions, we can try to take the specific primitive function of interest to search and find a good solution, and try to use that better solution to replace the original primitive function. As a result, the end-to-end -end solution become faster. Right. So let's try to do that, and we'll use uh, an example of two-layer, multi-layer perception from the last chapter. So we're going to do the same thing again, and uh, that's uh, the same set of preparations and executions we're going to do. And this particular case is a trousers. We're going to download the weight, and I want to remind everybody. So here's the two-layer model that we're going to use. And I'm going to load in the weights um, in here. And we're going to use a mixture module just to make the display simpler. So in this mixture module, the first layer calls into tensor R function that we are interested in here. The second two layers will just call into external library function. In this case, we are still going to use PyTorch. So our, our PyTorch library as our fallback. Okay, so the only thing that we can go and optimize for is this first layer. And here it uses a default implementation in here. Okay, and uh, if we're registering the corresponding torch function, we'll be able to we'll be able to, you know, and then we're gonna use a binded version in here that binds the parameter into it. And we should be able to go ahead and do our prediction and give us the trousers in here. And then if you look at the term, here's the original term cost. Uh, one thing I want to notice is that actually, you know, and because this is a very small model, so every time you run, it does come with a bit of fluctuation. So take those time costs with a grain of salt. But uh, oh, the overall magnitude is kind of reasonable. So, so you know, um, if you are going to go and do an optimization, you will find that actually you will get a speed up from this number. And let's try to recap what we want to do, right? So effectively, originally we kept uh, the things in here. So here's our original IR module, right? That comes with a linear function in here. And in order to go ahead and do MLC process on this, what we want to do is we want to go into transform this collection of tensor functions, right? In particular, we want to be able to take this linear function, go and run a set of stochastic transformation that give us a search space in here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to call a tune function that gives us a hopefully optimized linear function. Right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to remove this and then replace the linear function here. That will give us a final end-to-end -end module that, are, that is you know, more optimized because this particular primitive function is being replaced by another equivalent version, but uh, a more effective one. So that is kind of an overall idea of what we are going to do in here. Now, with this roadmap, what we're going to do is, is uh, first of all, we want to run this uh, stochastic transformation and tune step. So uh, currently, the uh, tune API only takes the IR module with one main function. So I'm going to do some simple transformation to take out the linear function, change this global symbol to main, and then trying to uh, convert it to another IR module. So effectively, this is just uh, another implementation of linear function. Uh, this module only contains linear function in this case. Uh, it's more linear. And uh, we can pass it to tune tier. That's going to run um, the tuning that gives us uh, an possibly optimized scheduling here. I'm going to wait about one minute. 
and then after we get the result what we're going to do is we're going to place the back so effectively uh, we're going to first get another binded version remember that this is from our original program and then i'm going to construct a new function from the tuned result and i'm going to get so here global variable in here means it's just like a pointer so because we don't want to only use string to indicate functions so global variable is just a pointer name that we use to specify global functions we can call then call the update function in here to try to update the original linear zero with the new function and then finally we're going to print out the code in here okay So hopefully it finishes tuning and then when we run it you'll find that actually in this particular case this linear zero in here is different from the original one so and this is the linear zero that's being found by the uh, by the meta schedule okay and then we go ahead and build it again uh, first of all you can find that it still gives you the right prediction trousers and then if you're going to run it um, does it become faster? In this case, actually, it may not become that faster because different runs come well, slightly faster. Right? 0 0.39, and in this particular case, 0.37. But the main purpose of this is trying to demonstrate you know, the overall flow of how we can go and uh, take the original model, take a linear function, and go ahead and replace that. So for this particular small model, the end impact is not as significant. But if we're going to see more bigger, real large models, then this replacement usually is going to give you much bigger impact in terms of the end-to-end -end running performance. Okay, so let's come back and summarize what we what we learned so far. So you can find that in the previous two chapters, we have focused a lot on what are the possible abstractions, what are the possible um, ways we can use to represent a tensor programs. And this chapter, this episode, we focus a lot more on how we can go and transform a tensor function, this particular case, a primitive tensor function. Right? And the second thing is we want to focus on what are the possible ways we can use to automate this. And in particular, what we're doing is we're trying to specify a set of stochastic transformations for what can be possibly optimized without actually specifying all the details. And then the stochastic transformation will help us to you know, search over that uh, the tuning algorithm will help us to search over the space and find a good solution and once we have this automated result what we can do is we can piggyback that onto the end-to-end -end flow rate by just replacing the original function with a new one that is informed by the overall tuning process so again we can find that we're following this generic moc process below except that we are focusing more on what are the set of transformation we have in this particular lecture we are mainly focusing on this automated search of primitive functions so we're taking one primitive function do a stochastic search tuning and then come back and replace in practice we uh, end to end neural network can have many many primitive functions so we want to do stochastic search and tuning for all of them and come back and replace and of course, in a lot of cases, maybe you know, doing tuning on all those primitives takes time. So we can also do other transformations, like replace some of them using library functions, or we can pre-tune a lot of these things. So we'll be able to go ahead and generate search space, try them out, and already record those results on my database. So next time when I come in, I will just need to look up, uh, you know, for this particular case, what is the set of optimized program that we can have and use that to do the replacement and we'll cover some of those apis as well in the following up lecture so you'll find that you know this overall process is centering really around the ir modules that help us to present the collection of mixture programs both primitive tensor functions as well as end-to-end -end executions using the competition graph and then we're going to do different kind of transformations so this lecture focuses on automating the stochastic transformation of a single permitted function 
And we'll talk about other ways of transformations or follow-up lectures. So we'll also how can we really compose them together to form an end-to-end -end deployment form. Okay, so that's the end of this lecture. Hopefully you enjoy it. And I will see you in two weeks. Thank you, everyone.